Today is Friday, January 7th. This is William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. I spoke recently on the subject of the, the dangers of disobedience. And I received a, a follow-up question from a friend who was listening to that talk and wanted me to go into more detail about our duty to obey parents as adults. And in this talk, which I, I think is going to be brief, I'd like to do that. One of the problems we have in modern society is that we don't study philosophy. Most Christian people have no influence in their thinking except what comes from divine revelation, and even that's usually limited. Usually it's not coming from a careful study of sacred scripture or the writings of the doctors of the church or catechisms. It's usually coming from cheap books that are read in leisure time that usually don't represent the actual teaching of the church and, and oversimplify issues and, and lead to other problems. They're, they're books that are for sale. It's a business. It's not where wise people seek the truth from. If we want the truth as Christians, as far as divine revelation is concerned, we should study the sacred scriptures and the official teachings of the Catholic Church. We should, teach, we should study the catechism. We should study the writings of doctors of the church. Even the writings of saints we have to be careful with because sometimes they're limited in application to certain places and times. That's the difference between a saint and a doctor of the church. So we have to be careful. But the bigger problem in modern Christian thinking is that there's almost no knowledge of just normal, rational philosophy. And many of the issues in life are settled through philosophy and aren't addressed in divine revelation because they're within the reach of human reason. There's no need for God to reveal truth on issues that can be obtained and should be obtained by men who are studying and meditating and exercising the faculty of reason. So our neglect of philosophy leads to a sort of skewed and oversimplified um, Christian mind that doesn't have answers for a lot of issues that in the past, even before Christianity, men had answers for just because they were philosophical. And this is one of these problems with this question of obedience to parents. If you'd like to read uh, an important book that will help you understand the philosophy of these things, go online and search up Cicero on duties. Cicero on duties. Another one you could look up is Seneca on benefits. Cicero on duties, Seneca on benefits. If we're reasonable, you don't have to be Christian to think like this. You don't have to be filled with grace to think like this. If we're rational, if we're reasonable, we'll understand that nothing in life is free. Nothing in life is free. All of this American talk of rights, and all, that needs to be thrown into the ocean because that has nothing to do with real life. That's political talk. That's political talk. That has nothing to do with family life. It has nothing to do with our relationships with other people. That only has to do with political, political power, political rights, and so on. It has nothing to do with our private lives, and it's not sufficient to guide our private lives. But we have to understand that from our conception, we did not make ourselves. We were carried in our mother's womb for nine months while she ate and took care of herself and protected us and allowed us to develop in her womb, she didn't take drugs, she didn't do anything 
self-destructive and the condition with which we were provided as pre-born children was so good that our bodies were able to develop and be safely born into the world. She was willing to undergo the pains of childbirth for us, risking her life for our birth. After we were born, she was willing to care for us, changing our diapers, washing us, feeding us, clothing us, keeping us safe as completely powerless, completely dependent little infants, watching over us, disciplining us, protecting us as we did all kinds of foolish things and would have destroyed ourselves, would have poisoned ourselves if we were left alone. Our fathers worked, earned money from their labor and gave it to us in the form of clothes and food and utilities, bedding, toys, on and on and on. We've received and received and received and wouldn't even exist if it weren't for benefits that we received from other individuals. And we are indebted to those individuals for life because of those benefits. We're obligated to honor our parents for their entire lives because of the benefits that we received from them without which we wouldn't even exist. We're obligated to honor our parents because of benefits we received that are invaluable. You can't put a price tag on them. You could never repay for the benefits that we've received from our parents. And the first thing we have to ask is whether we have that disposition toward our parents or whether we pretend that because they did something bad on a certain day or said something we don't like at a certain time or disagree with us on a certain issue that all of those benefits that they offered us are irrelevant. That's an irrational position to take. And our parents don't owe us. We owe them. And we do so throughout our entire lives. And that's natural piety, to honor our father and mother for our entire lives. And the commandment to honor our father and mother not only speaks specifically of that relationship to our parents, but also reveals the principle of obligation that we have based on benefits that we receive. And this leads us to a number of moral considerations if we want to be people who are actually reasonable and moral. First of all, when we receive benefits, benefits of any kind, of any value at all, whether small or great, we're obligated to return the favor. If someone does something good for us, we owe them. We owe them honor. We owe them whatever is appropriate for the benefit that we've received from them. What those specific debts are that we owe are separate questions. But when we receive benefits, we're obligated to return those benefits in a number of different ways. And if we are not interested in returning favors, if we're not interested in repaying obligations and exchanging benefits, then we need to learn to decline benefits. The option to take benefits and refuse to repay in any way those who offer us those benefits is not an option, at least for a moral person. If we accept benefits 
then we have to repay through obligations. I'd like you to listen to this passage from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. This is Romans chapter 13. He gets done talking about government officials and our obligation to obey the government because we receive benefits from the government. But he then expands upon that to address the broader principle, beginning in verse 7. So this is Romans chapter 13, verse 7. And I encourage you to read all of Romans chapter 13. He says, Render to all men their dues. Render to all men their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Notice how it expands from political obligations to personal obligations. From tribute or taxes to customs to fear to honor. Render to all men what is their due. And the principle there is that we are to always be sensitive to benefits that we receive. We're to be sensitive to benefits we receive and we're to be sensitive to the people from whom we receive benefits. Christians have this habit of imagining that because they're Christians and they want to promote some idea of Christian culture or Christendom, that they have a right to treat non-Christians like crap, to put it frankly. They think that they have a right to take from other people, and if those people aren't Christians, or if those people aren't part of their cultural club, they have a right to mistreat those people. They have a right to take benefits from those people and render them nothing in return. And they imagine that because they're Christians and because they're doing this for the sake of, let's say, Christian culture, that this is okay. But it's not okay. And in fact, it has a negative effect on society around us and makes Christianity appear to be a selfish, grasping, hoarding religion rather than a religion that has any relation to the cross. And this is the common public witness of Christianity. Christians are not willing to serve the state, but they're first in line for state benefits. They're critical of the government trying as hard as they can to pay no taxes and yet making use of every free benefit they can get their hands on. They're all over the local park. They're all over you know, the national parks and vacation spots, making use of all of the public benefits. But then when it's time to serve the state, they say, bah, I'm not interested in this secular state. They show no honor, no fear, pay no customs, wish to pay no tributes. They take and take and have no interest in giving. And this is the public witness of many Christian people. And what's true of the state is true of local communities, true of local schools, true of families. Many Christians have unbelieving parents or relatives, siblings, neighbors, who see them as the most selfish people they know, the most ungrateful people they know. And yet, they deceive themselves to imagine 
that because they do this or that for Christ, that they're part of some some Christian culture and community that actually is having the, the opposite effect around them that they claim to be interested in having. There's a, a disconnect between what they imagine themselves to be and what they actually are in their families, in their communities, in organizations they participate, in their country even. There's a disconnect between the generous, heavenly-minded, sacrificial people they imagine themselves to be and the selfish, grasping, disrespectful people that they actually are. And like I said, this is, this is common in Christian circles. All the bad-mouthing of the government, I talked about this in that other talk on disobedience, it all relates to this issue, this idea that because I'm a Christian, my dishonoring others, especially non-Christians, is justified because I serve a higher cause and I have a right to just use other people for the sake of that cause. That's not moral. Render to all men what is their due. If you are dependent on unbelievers, then you owe respect to those unbelievers. If you are dependent on government officials, then you owe respect and whatever else is required by those government officials. If you don't want to pay those debts, don't take those benefits. And we'll often find in life that we have no choice but to accept some benefits. And we have to understand that in those situations we realize that it's God's will that we learn to honor those debts, to honor those obligations, and witness to others of true righteousness and good morals. To not see that as some kind of contradiction of the Catholic faith, but rather the demonstration of the Catholic faith. This idea of Christendom, I think, is partly to blame. This idea that Christians are these independent, world-conquering, self-sufficient heavenly citizens, when in fact, they're no such thing. They're dependent on simple natural relationships. They're dependent on public benefits. They're dependent on common benefits available to ordinary people. And yet they have this, this comic book television idea of Christendom that makes them want to pretend they're some kind of, you know, um, crusaders. And yet they're no such thing. They're men who can barely provide for themselves, barely provide for their families, aren't smart enough to educate their own children, don't know how to manage a business, can't figure out how to pay their own taxes, and yet sitting around talking about Christendom. And this false idea of Christianity, that it's some kind of earth-conquering culture of self-reliant explorers and self-sufficient city builders, is, is stuff from literature and, and television and not real life. And it contributes to this justification for the disrespect of people from whom we receive benefits. Now, to get back to the original topic, we often find ourselves dependent on help from our natural relations. I've, I've gone through this myself. Um, my father is not a Christian. My mother is a Catholic. But when I started my adult life, I paid for myself to go to college. I was a, a poor school teacher started a family when I was pretty young, struggled financially as a school teacher. My wife was home with the children. We lived on a school teacher's salary. It was difficult for us to pay the bills and, and just provide for what we needed. And my parents 
with whom I enjoy a, a very happy relationship, offered me the opportunity to build a house on land that they owned in North Carolina. And we, we accepted that opportunity and went down and built a house for a fraction of anything we could buy anywhere else. In fact, when I was teaching in New Jersey, a parent who was wealthy, one of my students' parents who was wealthy, knew that we were having a difficult time financially and were renting an apartment and were considering moving someplace else. And he, he wanted to keep me at the school. He actually offered me $200,000. That would be an interest-free loan to help me buy a house. And yet the prices of houses in the area where I was teaching was so high that even that $200,000 interest-free loan, as incredible an opportunity as that might have been, still really didn't help us enough to make it possible for us to stay there. So we had opportunities, but ultimately my parents offered us the best opportunity to move down south, build a brand new house for a fraction of of anything that we could have done up north. And we've lived happily here ever since. And there have been days where my parents and I have gotten into conflicts and disagreements about different issues, and we've had to deal with things. And I know what people talk about when they, when they, when they fuss about having to honor their parents, especially when their parents aren't Christians. But I think we've got to think more spiritually than that and realize that when God says honor your mother and father, he doesn't say honor your good mother and father. He doesn't say honor your Christian mother and father. He doesn't say honor your saintly mother and father. Or he doesn't present the command with conditions. He says honor your mother and father because you receive benefits from them. That's why. And you're to be grateful and sensitive to those benefits. And those benefits are not related to Christianity. Those are natural benefits. And it challenges us to realize that there's more to the Christian life than just Christian pursuits. We also have to honor natural obligations and duties because this natural world into which we're born is part of God's creation, part of God's moral plan. Natural relations are real. And we're not, we're not exempt or freed from natural obligations when we decide to be Christians. Those relationships are still real. Those obligations are still binding even though our parents may not be Christians. A woman marries a man and she becomes a Catholic and then criticizes her husband because he's not a Catholic. And even though he hasn't changed, she wants to act as if she is somehow freed from the duties of marriage. You can see how that thinking works and how we can use Christianity as a justification to exempt ourselves from natural obligations. And we can't. And it's part, I believe, of God's providence in our lives. And it takes humility. It takes humility and takes patience and trust in divine providence to submit to these things and not imagine that there's, there's only one way, only one way, the way that is easiest and most flattering for us personally. And that anything other than what is easy and flattering is, we're going to pretend, is not God's will. I think that's a temptation that we have to learn to overcome. We can't pretend that something is not God's will because it's not pleasing to us. Or because it requires a longer path. Or it requires patience. It requires that everything can't be as perfect as we would like it to be, but because we are dependent on benefits received from others, 
we're going to have to take a longer and more winding path to get to where we'd like to get. The difficulty of that path, the inconvenience of those obligations is a challenge to us morally that we have to learn to embrace. The shortest path may not be God's will for us. And we can still hold on to our goals, but realize that the path to those goals is not going to be as convenient and simple or affordable or flattering as we'd like it to be. It's going to be humbling because we're going to have to admit our dependence on others and honor those others with whatever is due them. I know what that feels like. I know why Christians get frustrated by those things. But I think the attempt to use Christianity to justify taking and not repaying or pretending that we can live without anybody else's help in, in sort of a, an arrogant, spiteful um, self-reliance is just not real Christianity takes humility, takes patience. We have to be willing to carry the cross, accept greater burdens, lengthen our timelines, and so on, so that we can fulfill our obligations as we're constrained to do in God's providence. I think that addresses the real issue in question. We get very uncomfortable when kids get involved because we want to raise these little saints. We have this fairy tale image of our family life that we would like to live. And we think that anyone who doesn't live that way is just worldly or stupid or not as virtuous as us. And we ignore the fact that there are reasons why others don't do what they might ideally like to do. It's because of things like these, like they have other obligations. What if our parent becomes sick and we've got to spend time caring for an elderly parent who's sick and we don't get to homeschool the kids to raise the smartest kids on the block? We have to accept that as reality. That's God's will, God's providence. We've got to take care of a sick mother that's going to disrupt our nice little household schedule that's going to disrupt our perfect little homeschool that's going to have some negative effect on our children. It's going to bring us some dishonor in front of other people or in the eyes of other people. And that's what we're really ultimately upset about. We're upset about what other people are going to think about us. Not real consequences. Because after all, As far as our children are concerned, the only thing that we can do is obey God with all our strength. We can't control the entire universe. We can't control providence. We have to fulfill all of our obligations. Why is our obligation to our children so important and yet we think that our children's obligation to us or our obligation to our parents is not important? They're all important. All of these relationships are important. Unfortunately, I have to wrap up this talk, but I think that I've gotten to the the crux of the issue that concerns us in these things. And I'm happy to talk about it more, but I have to cut this off right now. But... We have to be careful. This, this isn't an issue of divine revelation. We have to be careful of false ideas like these, these stupid ideas about Christendom that modern men have who live in democratic societies and want to pretend that they're some kind of self-reliant medieval nobles. Um, we live in democratic society. Democratic society operates through compromise where... Individuals sacrifice personal benefits for the sake of the common good. And that that compromising life is part of 
what it means to be part of a community. That brings with it many benefits, which most of us take advantage of, but it also brings obligations that we bristle at when it's time to pay them. That's a moral issue, and we have to learn to deal with it. We have to learn that our Christian goals may be good, but the path that we have drafted or mapped out for us to accomplish those goals may not be realistic. Like I said, the road we have to take to accomplish these goals is often found to be much longer, much more difficult, much more expensive, much more tedious, much more winding than we originally expect. And that's why Jesus warned us and said, He who endures to the end shall be saved. When we learn that it's going to take a lot more to accomplish the goal than we originally thought, that's when we're really tested to see if we're really committed to that goal or if we're only committed to that goal if it could be obtained affordably and conveniently and in a way that flatters us all along the path. When we find that that path is not so easy, not so affordable, not so flattering, we're challenged to see whether we're really committed to that goal and are willing to persevere. I think that's the issue that we have to deal with on this topic. And like I said, I I have to cut this talk short tonight, but if you'd like to get more into that, I'd be happy to do so. God bless.